Welcome to The Clone Wars Season 1 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including the season. Nothing that comes after this will be spoiled in this video. I've loved each episode of this so far. A lot of the positives I am putting in the review and I try not to, you know, repeat myself, I guess just briefly. So, I really appreciate all the tension and suspense. The, the action is very cool, very well choreographed. I appreciate the, um, what's it called? The, the uh, cr creativity on display in the designs and such. It's very cool seeing stuff in Star Wars that isn't in the movies. I think that is going to have to do it. Yeah, I like the animation. Apparently some people didn't, or maybe that was just the movie. Uh, but, but yeah. So, um... I did watch the movie when it came out, not in theaters. Uh, I got it from the library. And other than that, everything, you know, this is the first time I watch The Clone Wars. So, yeah, if I if I get something wrong, I'm, I'm not going to be referencing later seasons. So there might be some stuff I say in this that is disproven by later seasons. But, yeah, I don't know how long this video is going to get. It might not be, you know, hugely long. It's not that I didn't love the episodes. I, some of them I don't have that much to say, and it'd be, I'd just be saying over and over, you know, yeah, the positives I already mentioned. So that, let's get. With that said, let's get into the film. I don't. It's not the very best. I would say the, the episodes of the seasons are better than the, the film. Honestly, nearly everything negative that I have to say... Uh, hold on, let's see. Actually, yeah, nearly everything I have to say about the pilot film has been said really well by other YouTubers. I wouldn't go as far as they do. I, did, I didn't hate it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't hate it when I watched it in 2008. I didn't hate it on this rewatch. I will be, there, there will be links in the description box to a couple of videos talking about the, the problems with the, the pilot film. But I did say nearly everything. The couple of things that I didn't see others mention, I get that by the time this was released, there were some very specific expectations for what you would get from a Star Wars movie, but I can't help but note that the things that are different in this from the episodes do still take inspiration from some of the same places, like instead of the opening crawl, we have this World War II style newsreel update on how the war is going, the way that a bunch of World War II things helped inspire the way things are in the original trilogy. The art style is retro, which, again, you know, a lot of retro about the, you know, Star Wars is basically reimagining retro. The, uh, originally. And... Like him or hate him, Zero the Hut is clearly inspired by Truman Capote, who was a big deal when George Lucas was young. Personally, I like his character fine. Maybe it helps that I love Truman Capote as Lionel Twain in Murder by Death, which is the only thing that I <clears throat> have seen him in. I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, Truman Capote, but yeah, I, th I think he is spot on in that movie. Like, if you at all think that's a movie that you would like... I wholeheartedly recommend it. If I can find a copy, I will probably do a video review. Now, some people dislike that the Jedi help Jabba. Let's keep in mind, the Star Wars movies are full of un uneasy alliances. You know, when they're like... When, when Obi-Wan and Luke approach Han Solo, they base it, they really don't trust him. They're like, well, I mean, as, as long as we pay him, he's going to do what we want, but... You know, they, they don't necessarily expect, like, betrayal, but they're not like, oh, this is a stand-up guy. This is, we can, we can definitely build a long-term relationship with, no, no, they're just like, well, we gotta get from one place to the other. We really can't let the, the, uh, the, the Empire know that we're traveling. Uh, I guess we gotta do, you know, like, at first, they're very hostile towards each other. So I was a little worried, you know, I, I didn't remember the, the Zero the Hut, uh, you know, when I did research for the season. So I was a little worried that there would be homophobic and or transphobic jokes about him. But honestly, you know, if, if you're an uh, LGBTQ 
individual please let me know but as far as i could tell it was basically just representation you know they they don't make him out to be worse now you know in 2008 homophobia was unfortunately still very mainstream you know today it's a bit less accepted but yeah you know if you look that there were people who were like freaking out about it but it's if, if you just look at the way he is depicted you know yeah, like, yeah, I suppose, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's the kind of, uh, it's, it's the effeminate stereotype for gay, for, for uh, gay men, but it's not actually, like, like, just look at, like, honestly, he comes, Zero the Hut is a way more appealing character than the, the, um, ah, what's his called? Well, uh, Jabba, you know, or Yaba, as apparently... Diego Luna, you know, because he, he, when he was a kid, he saw it in, I guess, Spanish or something. Anyway, he's way more, like, Jabba is despicable in the movies. Zero really isn't, like, yeah, you know, obviously it's not wonderful that we have this, you know, effeminate gay man, but he's really not made out to be bad, like, because he's gay. Like, yeah, you know, you can't really trust him. You can't trust Jabba either. You know, it's not like... And, and Jabba, like, you get, like... Uh, I, I forget if... I'm not sure they've ever really said, although I guess in the prequel movies, did he have a wife in Phantom Menace? I, I feel like... Anyway, I would definitely say Jabba the Hutt is male. He, he, he comes across as masculine, and he's a way worse person than Zero is, if you just look at the way, you know, the, the things they do, and, and the, like, yeah. You know, okay, I'll, I'll grant that Zero, you know, was okay with a, a member of his family being threatened, which I suppose, ah, uh, okay, that is a, perhaps a trope, a negative trope of, of a, a homophobic trope, that gay people are a threat more so than straight people. Fair enough. There's that, but other than that, I, I did not detect any. So one of the droids says 1137 and then some more numbers. Do you mind if I just round that up to 1138? The vertical battle isn't half bad. Let's see. Okay, um, I gotta say, I am nearly certain. Like, percentage-wise, I am like... 19% sure that the reason for the nickname Clankers is that they clank, like the noise that droids make, but I can't be the only person who thinks it sounds dirty. Let's see. Honestly, I was kind of expecting to have to do the film in multiple sittings. I ended up getting through it in a single sitting fine. Like, I, I really think, I, I get why people were very disappointed, because they basically wanted more of the movies, and this is not really that. You know, the, the film is really not just another movie. It, it features characters, sure, from the movies, but it's not the same thing. And I get being, you know, like I said earlier in this video, there were certain expectations for Star Wars when, when this came out, and... Yeah, you know, I, I think I've always just viewed it as, well, it's a pilot that they put in theaters, so, yeah. Let's see. I appreciate that Anakin really doesn't want to leave Rex, but has to, like, the, the sacrifices made for it, yeah. Let's see, and, and the ship has a holographic doctor for their voyage, yeah. Always love seeing a Natalie Portman character be badass. Maybe it's just me. I got a real Terminator vibe off that droid that approaches her, like, claws out, like, right after she's discovered in the Room of Zero. And Dooku attacks Anakin's backpack. Unfortunately for the... And... And, fortunately for the good guys, Anakin had a plan. And that plan rocks. Now, Sam Jackson did voice the character in the, the film pilot... Even though he didn't for the rest of the show, some people say that he did it for an easy paycheck, while others correctly identify he's such a big nerd, he loves doing this, so he jumped at the chance. Like, 
I don't know how anyone misses. Like, I guess they've never seen an interview where he talks about, like, he he's he geeks out about d doing these things. Like, just, yeah. Anyway. Um, right, right, yeah. Some, some critics said that... Like, yeah, like like I mentioned, you know, a lot of what critics said, I'm not really gonna comment on. Some people, m multiple people, separately of each other, not like just one thread of comments, multiple people separately from each other said that the nicks nicknames used by some of the characters are a sign of disrespect. Really? There are tons of nicknames in the movies. Han calls Luke Kid, Obi-Wan Old Man, Leia Princess, which, yes, is her title. But the way he says it is mocking, and she'd rather be called Leia. The Millennium Falcon is referred to as Old Piece of Junk. Leia calls Solo Flyboy. I don't know about you, I'd much rather be called Sky Guy than Annie. Which is the usual nickname for Anakin. But, but yeah, um, I... Yeah, I don't know, I feel like some people were just really reaching, uh, you know, I, I get, like, maybe not being a big fan of, of Ahsoka from the, the pilot film, I, I think she's fine, and, like, you know, she gets better. Now, the... Yes, so that brings us to... Season 1, Episode 1, Ambush. Yes, I will be calling Episode 1, even though the pilot film is technically the first several episodes, so, yeah. It is not like Jedi to be late. A Jedi is never late. A Jedi is never early. A Jedi arrives exactly when he means to. And the clone doesn't th really think the escape pod will go well. I guess he didn't watch A New Hope. What a terrible shot. It's my programming. Disagree, it's plot armor. And Ventress intends to test Yoda. Very cool. Always love seeing guerrilla tactics. At first, like, I, I don't know why. I guess I just kind of thought, oh, you know, guerrilla tactics for one episode. No, 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 there's a bunch of guerrilla tactics throughout this entire season. And I'm guessing probably the rest of the show. Because, yeah, there's a lot of guerrilla tactics in Star Wars. Your faces, I wish to see. Yeah, I don't know any of you people. Helmet's back on. Seriously, though, I do love that Yoda knows the individual clones and the point made that just because you have the same DNA doesn't mean you can't be different. Now, in the real world, clones do not exist, but some people remain shocked that twins can be incredibly different from one another. Let's see. I don't remember if I did, but I do want to put that in the review notes as well, so I am just going to copy it, and there we go. So, there, yes. And... A lot of smoke for a surrender. So what you're saying is, where there's no smoke, there is surrender. And when Ventress realizes her negotiations have failed, she tries to assassinate the king. Yoda stopped it, but she escaped by sending debris that Yoda has to catch with a telekinesis, a move that she picked up from Dooku, evidently. And that brings us to the next episode, Rising Malevolence. I always like seeing General Grievous, and I really appreciate, you know, the ion cannon can easily destroy destroyers, which, you know, every so often this in, in this season, they'll, they'll have some weapon or tactic or something that completely, you know, that forces the other side to rethink just tactics and such. That's really cool. Great to see Placoon. I, I know that, like, he is apparently popular with people who watch this show. That, you know, because he has, he has nothing to do in the prequels. Now, obviously... There are a lot of characters in the... There, there are a lot of designs in the prequels that make you think, wow, I wish I could see more of that character. Uh, you know, and part of that is that they were able to do a lot. Of, you know, there, there are more new designs in the prequels than in the original trilogy, which is really down to just technology, you know. 
so yeah but i'm i'm glad to see the you know because they could easily have just you know and certainly they did invent some new characters that aren't in the movies but yeah placoon getting some development for him was was cool let's see and the yeah so katana and anakin both want to look for survivors and he is just annoyed that ahsoka tells the council and in contrast, the battle droids in space are executing the defenseless, so I appreciate that. Oh, right, I just realized I forgot to say that, but some of what I'll be talking about are the messages that this season communicates. And, yeah, very tense and suspenseful ending when they just barely escape the weapon in time. Very, very cool. Next episode, Shadow of Malevolence. And in the exchange between Grievous and Dooku, again we see that good guys take care of their people, whereas the bad guys don't. And then Grievous says, target those escape pods, I have a reputation to uphold. And, yeah, you know, targeting a medical facility is also really despicable. So, again, appreciate that that's something it, you know, points out. Because, you know, that is... Sadly, it is true. American military have targeted first responders. Um, and I don't think that was common knowledge when this episode first premiered. So, but, you know, nevertheless, now you can look at that and see, you know, wow, that really is despicable. And, yeah, they travel through the nebula, but it's full of manta. Very cool. And... Yeah, loved seeing the fighters take on other fighters. And Ahsoka Tana manages to convince Anakin to change the plan, and it works. So we see that Anakin still sometimes throws himself and others into danger and needs someone to pull him back. And... Destroy Malevolence is the next episode. I'm really glad that Padme wasn't just a hostage for this episode. Not gonna lie, I did really fear that that would be the case when I saw the tractor beam. Instead, she blows up her own ship, she hides, she even shoots some battle droids. Very cool when Obi is fighting battle droids. I like the line, you are a sight for short circuits instead of sore eyes. Very cool when Obi is fighting General Grievous. A really exciting escape and Padme takes up a gun on the ship refusing to just be like a passenger or a tourist or something just yeah next episode is rookies and yeah so the young clones start out kind of bored or at least one of them is kind of bored at the facility but droids hide in a meteor shower and fight their way that that is again that's so clever because like how would you, why would you think that a meteor shower would be carrying droids? And do they also mention that they wouldn't have been able to scan for, for droids in the meteor? I, I forget, but yeah. And more Terminator vibes when one of them loses an arm, replaces it with a sword or something. Just, yeah. And when the inspection team calls, one of the it calls in one of the commando droids poses as a clone with helmet, voice, and later even armor. So that's clever. And that, you know, then you understand that's why they brought commando droids instead of just. Which I don't. Did we see them in the movies? I, I don't recognize them from the movies at least. And you know, instead of just regular battle droids. Very cool giant eel. We had Jedi with us on Tiburon, and they helped. And the clones fake their way into the facility by doing the opposite of what the droid did. Yeah, I'll, I'll grant that it's kind of goofy, but yeah, I, I liked it. And yeah, the clones have to destroy the outpost in order to win the day. You didn't say please. Badass! And the remote control doesn't work, so Heavy has to manually detonate self-sacrifices. And, yeah, because of how well they did, they're recruited for the 501st, which becomes Vader's Fist. And that brings us to the next episode. Oops. 
downfall of a droid. Anakin misses R2-D2 and Obi-Wan kind of doesn't. At first I wondered if the thing about not erasing the memory was a lie so that Obi-Wan would agree to let him go, but apparently it was true. And yeah, I I got real strong vibes of Goldie must be a spy from this episode and it is then you know revealed next episode. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, either Goldie is a spy, or they're going to do a thing where later he proves himself to Anakin. Let's see. You know, it's, it's, yeah, you know, otherwise he certainly makes a lot of mistakes for someone that's supposedly faster than R2 units and on Anakin's side. And I appreciate that, like, Ahsoka starts out very sympathetic to Goldie, defending him. But when she realizes he's a spy, she's not, like, delusional and is like, oh, that can't be right because I like him. No, no, no. Sometimes people you like do the wrong thing, you know, and, and even for the wrong reason. So, yeah, I appreciate You know, I, I could see there's probably a number of kids who watched the episode and were more open to the idea that maybe some, you know, like, let's say someone in your friend group breaks the law, for example, uh, you know, yeah, when I was seven, I knew another seven-year-old who was stealing money. Uh, let's see, I gotta translate it into, because Americans don't know how much Danish crowns are worth. Let's see, times seven, so I guess it's like, 50, yeah, 15 bucks. He stole 15 bucks at once. So, yeah. And I'd like to think, yeah, yeah, I did know that that was wrong of him to do. The Trend Ocean picked up R2, and Anakin poses as, like, I guess Ahsoka Tana's father, certainly relative, to buy R2, and she absolutely hates it, which is kind of funny because she also says and does things that he really hates, so it's like payback. Very cool fight against the assassin droids. And Anakin outflies all the fighters on Grief's ship. Very cool. And that brings us to the next episode, Duel of the Droids. I guess the fates were taking a day off. We see Grievous kill the Trandoshan to avoid paying him, adding that to the list of reasons why he's evil. You know, yeah, Donald Trump, he doesn't kill people to avoid paying them, but he doesn't. He, there's a lot of people he did not pay. Let's see. And very tense when Ahsoka has to sneak around Grievous and the clones and Anakin in the landing area. And I like the duel between R2 and Goldie. Next episode. Bombad Jedi. So... Jar Jar is clumsy, and the way he speaks is also a racist stereotype in this episode, like he was in The Phantom Menace, even though this is said after Attack of the Clones, when he no longer was. Not really a fan of his parts of the episodes of this season, only, honestly, I will just let you know when there is an episode of this show that features Jar Jar, where the parts he's in don't annoy me. Other than that, I do love the episodes, and I will acknowledge, you know, it is that thing of... You know, sometimes he will accidentally help with his clumsiness. Now, let's see. And, yeah, Padme walked into a trap, betrayed by her close friend. In real life, war does turn friends into enemies. And she later acknowledges that his people were not a priority because they weren't as useful as an ally. And that doesn't mean they shouldn't be considered an ally. Padme manages to escape her cell by tricking the droids into thinking the Jedi is rescuing her. I love when she goes full action hero. Though at this point, after seeing both clones and her do it, I really have to point out, somehow it's not only Jedi who can, you know, fight battle droids, like, um, hand, hand to hand, without, like, breaking feet and hands and such. I kind of assumed that the Jedi were using the Force to protect their feet or something when kicking droids 
I do like that because Jar Jar befriends the giant slug, which might look scary to him, but isn't trying to be. Very Psychonauts, love it. Attacks and helps out. Next episode is... Cloak of Darkness. And Luminara is told they're going on an escort mission, which I know from video games usually suck. Luminara is trying to mind-read Gunray, struggling to get results. Ahsoka Tana threatens him with death, and he appears to be more willing to negotiate. So this is yet another post-9-11 piece of American media that makes excuses for torture. In fact, one could easily read into this episode that they should have threatened him like that sooner, and they might have gotten something out of him before he was rescued. This despite the fact that in real life, there is no credible evidence that torture gets credible intel. You know, what they did during World War II was provide like food and treat treat well the the prisoners they knew the prisoners of war they knew would have a lot of information and it worked you know because the suddenly these these nazis were like oh wow i guess we're friends now They're, i've been told so many in, you know just ridiculous lies about the things that these people do but no they're really friendly to me and that you know so yeah and that's why I'm, you know they could very easily you could have had, and and yeah, Ahsoka Tana is actually in other episodes. You know, she she is very patient and empathetic and sympathetic towards at least some people, some some like yeah, individuals. In the case of Goldie, not quite a life form, an AI, but the so so yeah, have Luminara struggle with the the mind control, and then Ahsoka says, of course we're not going to get information out of him if we treat him badly. Maybe we could, you know, give him, you know, give him a little good food or something, which, yeah, that's what they did, and that's what worked. And Ventress continues to be really badass. I really enjoyed the brief but super cool fights where she was taking on Luminara and Ahsoka Tana at the same time. Okay, it's legitimately funny when Ahsoka is trying to figure out if she should go help Luminara or not, and the captain, then the clone officer, and finally Newt all offer their advice, and nobody wants to hear Newt. What? <laughs> and it's revealed the captain is a separatist spy. Ventress killed him rather than getting some of the credit for the mission. Again, evil. I appreciate, like, the spy story is... Perhaps a tad obvious, like, you know, if you're doing a, a story with a, about war and you have to force someone into changing their tactics, a spy is kind of obvious. There's really only two spies in this entire season, 22 episodes and the the movie, which, uh, let's see, it's, an, it's 100 minutes, which I guess makes it like five episodes, or four episodes, four or five episodes, and really only two actual spies so yeah really really love that almost every single character in this episode is someone that we don't know if they survive until the events of revenge of the sith gunray is the only major character heavily featured in this episode in danger that we do know will make it and that brings us to the next episode layer of grievous the powerful need to restrain their power. That is one of the most important messages to communicate today. So, absolutely love it. We've seen countless stories where something turns out to be a trap. This is one of the rare cases where a bad guy made a trap for another bad guy, and the good guys may be able to stop a bad guy rather than just have to escape the trap. And... Really cool fight between Grievous the Jedi and the clones using the wires. They even managed to cut off his legs, but he's barely slowed down. Badass. Even Separatist doctors are jerks. Wow. And Grievous reactivates and sets his bodyguards on them. So Kit Fisto is another Jamaican stereotype, but he's much more subdued than Jar Jar Binks, and not really painted in a negative light at all. He's a great Jedi Master. This is how you do it. It's not wrong to base a character on a real-life ethnicity as long as you do it respectfully. I forget if I put that in the review, so I'll just really quickly copy it to make sure that I do. I did not mean for that to rhyme. The good guys are attacked by a droid dragon, a droigan, if you will. 
the rules have changed. Maybe you have changed. And at the end of the episode, Yoda says, Fighting power with power is not the Jedi way, but war can make us lose our way. Another great message. And, yeah, Dooku is testing Grievous because he has failed recently. And... Uh, let's see. Is that the right name? I don't remember that. Hmm. But yeah, uh, Nada, I guess, versus Grievous and his bodyguards is very cool. And Kid Fisto versus Grievous is also really cool. <clears throat> Episode 11, Dooku Captured. Better bickering between Anakin and Obi-Wan than in the prequels. I like how we don't quite know what to make of the pirates, and it seems like Dooku might be able to get help from them, not be betrayed. And at the party, they swap glasses, but it seems from the next episode like it didn't matter, so I'm not entirely sure. I don't know, it's possible I missed something about how they still got knocked out, but yeah. And that brings us to the Gungan General. I didn't really feel like it was necessary to have so many failing escape attempts by the Chain Gang Trio. So far, these are the only time for the show have, to have wasted time. Stuff happening without progressing plot in, in some way. And... Yeah, more Jar Jar... And the episode ends with Dooku getting away, but the Jedi are also free, so something was accomplished. I think it would have been very frustrating if the episode ended with the Jedi still trapped. The next episode, Jedi Crash. Amazing opening air battle. I can't help but notice that in this and the next, and maybe more episodes with Ayla Secura... Her cleavage is visible in almost every single shot, like, including a lot of close-ups on her face. I do appreciate that she gets personality now. I don't think she even had a single line in the prequels. And, you know, certainly I didn't know her name before watching... Or, uh, let's see. I think I found out her name from somewhere else. But if I only watched the prequels, you know, th then this would have been the first time I actually heard her name. And they manage to get to the planet, and Anakin is hurt, but tries to speak. Be diamonds? Behind you! Be behind you, Anakin. I know you're really messed up here. He can't possibly be behind himself. Very cool seeing the bird aliens. They have a bit of a griffin thing going on. I like it. Another. And good philosophical debate between the Lerman leader and the Jedi. And you can really understand his point of view. It takes two to fight. And three to tango. And the healer stops the bird creature with, uh, like, you know, uh, what's it called? Like a, just, you know, cowboy move. I forget what it's called. Defenders of Peace. And, yeah, the Separatist army does a search of the Lerman village, like Mania Fascist. And they test the... The, uh, wait, did they call it that? I don't think they called it that. Anyway, they test the, the bomb thing in a safe place, and then they intend to bomb the Lerman village, which has to be a reference to the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, a war crime that should never be forgotten. So I really appreciate that the Lerman here are depicted as in no way deserving of it. I know, to those of us, those of us with empathy, the idea that someone could deserve being nuked is obviously absurd. But the excellent crack show Cannonball did an episode relatively recently where apparently another cartoon partially made for children had an episode that said that the Japanese did deserve it, which is just despicable. Love the use of guerrilla tactics to get into the base. And the Jedi use the pods for defense. And the Lerman leader is like, Mr. Jedi, tear down this wall. And the Lerman leader still insists they not change their morals, but a number of his citizens go against that when faced with a horrible reality. And this is another lesson for the young viewers. If your leaders are telling you to do the wrong thing, even if it's what you're used to, you have to go against them. And a lot of leaders are very married to the way things used to be. 
So some Lurmen defeat some of the droids without technology, so this is, this is somewhat like the Ewoks, only because it's a much smaller battle, I find it much more palatable. I do really love when Star Wars references the Vietnam War and makes the Viet Cong the good guys. Trespass is the next episode. You know, because if you think about it, like, the, the Viet Cong were not trying to, like, destroy America. They just... You know, they wanted control of their own country. So, this episode is from 2009. features a species of people with blue skin, some with big eyes, who hail from the planet Pantora. So, I'm sure you won't be surprised when I refer to them as the Blue Man Group. They are convinced that it's not Separatist, because the computers are untouched, and if there's one thing Separatists love, it is to touch computers. I'm not sure why they decided to leave CPO behind, but I do appreciate that they communicate with the Tolls with drawings. I can imagine kids watching this episode being more open to nonverbal communication, whether it's people who speak a different language or perhaps they have a physical condition that prevents them from speaking. Okay, so the Tolls are definitely not... Let's see... Yeah, the Tolls are definitely not dead set on destroying the Blue Man Group. Honestly, the only way things could go wrong here is if war were declared. And and our chairman, Big Brain here, war were declared. Avenge me! And there's this brief moment where we ver worry the leader is going to stab the center, but instead stabs the snow. Anti-war message, I am here for it. <coughs> And that brings us to the next episode, The Hidden Enemy. So, I have my notes on paper. So, yeah, the, the very exciting opening with the, the position being compromised. And we learn that they have a spy in their midst. And more Ventress, very, very cool. And they question the the... The clones checking their alibis, and at first it seems like maybe Chopper is the spy, but we find out, you know, basically he's he's starting to lose it. He has made a droid finger necklace, which, again, is reminiscent of some Vietnam vets who, yeah. And, yeah, turns out that Slick is the traitor, and... They, you know, the, the two other clones managed to, to trick him and trap him in, I guess it's like a control room or something. And we do hear his motivation for being a, a spy, so I appreciate that. And that brings us to Blue Shadow Virus. So yeah, a virus, a secret swamp lab, very cool concept. Of course, droids don't need to worry about viruses affecting them, and, you know, the mad scientist does have this protection, what, what's it called, like a, you know, glass he puts over his, his head. I don't love the stereotypical German mad scientist. I'm sure there were lots of them in movies that helped inspire the original Star Wars movies, but I do worry that some Americans might start to bully Germans based on this episode. I love that they performed a robot lobotomy, though I do, of course, wish they had referred to it as a robotomy. Mystery of a Thousand Moons. And this time the virus is released, but the lab is sealed, and Anakin and Obi-Wan have to get the cure, then release the other good guys trapped inside the lab. Logical next step, and it doesn't feel like it should just have been a subplot in... The episode before this one. And I... I basically, the only thing about this episode... I felt like it took forever for Ahsoka Tano to start showing symptoms. Which, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe her alien biology could help. Actually, yeah, fair enough. That probably explains it. And Anakin struggles with self-control because he fears he won't be able to get the cure in time to Padme and... 
yeah, we meet Jabo, a kid who reactivated a bunch of droids. I can imagine a lot of kids thought he was really cool. And, yeah, you know, usually characters like that that are just made for kids to think he's cool can be kind of annoying, but, yeah, I, I didn't mind him. While from a dramatic perspective, I don't mind the idea of Padme's seal being broken, it just frustrates me that it's done with Jar Jar's slapstick, and they even have more of that right before the end of the episode, so that was, yeah. And the security system and the way the two Jedi bypass it is clever. And... Storm over Ryloth. Now, it is sadly true that as an officer, it's basically impossible to avoid people dying, so you just gotta make it count. And... Innocence of Ryloth. And, yeah, we see evil use human shields while the good try to avoid friendly fire, which has happened in the Middle East from the American side. This can be seen as partially critical of the wars in the Middle East, which is a perfect place for me to quote a... When Jimmy Carr... Kids probably shouldn't look him up, if in case any were watching this video. But when Jimmy Carr realized there was a an, an American... In the crowd of one of his shows, he, you know, he asked him, "What's the difference between a British soldier and an Iraqi one?" Which just, yeah, the American took it well, if if I recall. And some of the clones throw grenades from cover to stop machine gun nests. Very World War Two. And as the clones walk through the ghost town, one of them says, "It's creepy." Clearly worried that he'll accidentally walk into Ghosts of Mars. So, so yeah, but just briefly, I realize for some of these episodes I'm talking much longer than for others. It doesn't mean that I didn't like the other episodes. I just didn't always, you know, I didn't always think of good riffs, for example. And they find Numa, and one of the clones worries the other is scaring the little girl. And she bites the hand of one of them, so she must think that he's Michael Bean in a James Cameron movie. She has serious Newt energy going on. Newt, the character from Aliens, who's human, not Newt Gingrich, the real-life human who behaves like an alien. He's going to be in the nominee. And she calls them Nera, which we're later told means brother, which is quite sweet. Give someone food and they eat for a day and possibly follow you. Teach them how to fish and they'll spend hours whining whenever they don't have an easy time impaling living beings rather than just buying food. And the clone calls the little one Biter. The odds are 742 to 1. So you're saying there's a chance. I liked Obi-Wan taking care of the creatures with mind tricks and some with dodging. And certainly he seemed to try to avoid hurting them. You know, he realizes they're, you know, what was it they've been, they've been starved. So, yeah. And they're shown a tunnel by Numa and allows them to free the prisoners, showing that not only is empathy right, it can also really help your own situation. And the Twi'lek attack and the droid does not understand why. He was thinking of them as victims, not people. So that's another great message there and brings us to the episode Liberty on Ryloth and we see that evil enslaves kill and rob people and later in the episode the bombers attack the capital with Emir still in it they aren't even uh, what's it called they, they don't even really take care of their own I really like the detail that the droids use non-metal detectors in order to assure that only robots are on the transports. That's quite... Well, actually, I guess there it's, it's probably scanning for life, but just the fact that they looked so much like metal detectors, just, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And that brings us to the season finale... 
host hostage crisis, yes. So let's see. I have some things that are not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I wrote down some of my major issues with the prequels that are not in the original trilogy. And one, yeah, one is too much politics. And that I will say, this this show does a good job of not focusing on, you know, certainly there are some politics. So, but, but it's not, it doesn't take over the way that it does in the prequels. Right, and yeah, in in Revenge of yes, Revenge of the Sith, I have a difficult time telling who's winning in the battle scenes, and that's yeah, I I haven't had trouble with any with that in any episode of season one. And right, they also I I didn't feel emotionally engaged with the the prequel movies, but I do with these episodes. And they were also too busy visually, which the show isn't. Now, that I think is it. So, episode, uh, yes, those were those were notes that I'm gonna be going over each time I talk about a season finale in in this for for this. Uh, yeah, but here are some uh, right, and I'll just uh, briefly say so. The let's see, I guess the. Uh, I, yeah, you, this is the part where I'm going to rate whether, I, I would definitely say that the finale, the season finale is great, and the season overall is great. I suppose the, if we're counting the film as the pilot, I wouldn't necessarily quite call it great, but it is good. It's not outright bad, in my opinion. The, um, let's see, what was the ambush... If ambush is the the um, uh, hold on, if I oh yeah I can do it like that. Okay, so ambush. What was that one? That was the one with the oh yeah Yoda being tested by Vance. Yeah, yeah, that is a, a really great. If if we call that one the the pilot episode of yeah. So yeah, this uh, episode introduces us to Cad Bane, who really is. Immediately, like, he stepped right out of a Western, and I I watched a video, I guess, okay, by now it's been a little while, maybe months, maybe a year, that pointed out that technically the original Star Wars trilogy, or, or certainly at the very least the very first movie, is basically a weird Western more than it is science fiction, because there are a lot of Western traits in that first one. And, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to, you know, Cad Bane stepped right out of Western. And, yeah, he's, yeah, really loved. And, and great plan he has. So, so that's good. And, yeah, we see Padman and Anakin together. And, I, so, yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, you can read into the, the prequel trilogy that the reason that Anakin struggles so much is because he loves people close to him where, you know, if, if only he could stop loving his mother and Padme. I, th I feel like this episode, it's actually, you know, Anakin is able to help because they, you know, because the two were, were close together. And sure, the, the lightsaber is... You know, the fact that he's missing the lightsaber for some of the episode does, you know, potentially present a problem. But then on the other hand, no, no yeah, he probably would have been able to, to get completely past if he still had the lightsaber. Yeah, but then, yeah, then um, uh, Cad Bane might have de detonated or, or threatened... Anakin that he would detonate if he tried freeing the hostages. So anyway, uh, so so yeah, we we there's more than one IG droid in this. At least one of them we don't hear speak. So I have to wonder if if he did, if he would sound like Taika Waititi. 
And uh, yeah, this is this is the Die Hard episode, so absolutely love that. You know, two great tastes that taste great together. And yeah, Zero is freed by Cad, and you know, Cad Bane says he doesn't work for free, and that. Yeah, so the episode doesn't the the episode and the season don't really end on an outright cliffhanger. You know, I I was wondering and a little bit fearing because this is back when sometimes TV shows had cliffhangers. But yeah, the the uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, I I really appreciate that. I, I like that sometimes the good guys actually lose in one of these episodes. That's, you know, keeps you guessing. So so that's that, that was another thing. I, I've, I'll admit that when I watched the, the prequels as a teenager, I didn't really think about it. But re-watching them, I, I feel like, oh, wow, I really should have seen this and that and the other thing coming. So, but, but yeah, um, really love the season so far. Really glad I'm watching these. And, yeah, looking forward to, you know, I'll, I'll probably start watching the, the next season t tomorrow. But, yeah, uh, about two weeks from now will be the next video on this show. And as soon as, you know, anything live action, Star Wars, I realize, let's see, I think it was the Bad Batch that, you know, went to Disney Plus recently that I haven't done videos on. Based on what I've heard, I should watch the rest of, you know, all, all of the animated Star Wars that came before that, before I do that. But I do intend to do it when I get to the, yeah. I'll, I'll do, you know, not all of, but most of animated Star Wars in the, the, the series, not the micro-series. Oh, I'll only do one of the micro-series, the, the, ah. let's see, what, what's... I, yeah, I have the list right here. It's the one called Forces of Destiny, because that one, yeah, as, as far as I can tell, a lot of the micro-series, animated micro-series and shorts, are basically just, you know, for, for kids, and they maybe explain what the various creatures are and, and such, but, you know, Forces of De Destiny, let's see, so... It's a collection of two to three minutes short centering on female characters featured in previous Star Wars. So, yeah, that one I intend to do. But, yeah, I, um, yeah, looking forward to, to more of this. I'm, I'm glad that I finally got around to doing it, but, you know, I wasn't originally, I only, yeah, I've, I've really missed doing shows. I, I, you know, I got back into it with, the Marvel Netflix shows, and once I got really into that, I was like, okay, I gotta find something to do after Marvel Netflix, so, yeah, now it's gonna be animated Star Wars, and, yeah, really happy with my decision so far. I, I try not to subject myself to media that I think I'm not going to enjoy these days. You know, I, I used to, part of the channel, part of my channel here used to be about you know, ranting about bad media, but I'm not really that excited about that kind of thing anymore. But yeah, you know, I'm glad other people are doing it. Uh, to You know, if, if they enjoy doing it, I, I think it's great that they are doing it, but it's not really what I personally want to make. I, I still watch some of, you know, I can still enjoy Phalus turning into a bad movie, uh, you know. Anyway, yeah, that's it. I intend to do more videos this week i at, at least one more just to not jinx it but yeah there should be at least one more video this week and if not if if i don't you know if i don't see you in that one i hope i will catch you sometime next week so may the force be with you